publishers targeted the consent decrees. They said these consent decrees interfered with their ability to obtain fair market value rates. And that's why some of the larger run ones uh, first began withdrawing their digital rights. Um, that's, they felt that's the only way they could get um, a higher rate, a more decent rate, a, a rate that they felt was more equitable. Um, and this would also allow the music publishers to not be governed by the consent decree in matters dealing with these digital performance rights licensing. Um, so the major music publishers and independent music publishers were in this process of pulling their digital rights with the PROs. EMI, Sony ATV, UMG Publishing were even in the process of negotiating direct deals with Pandora um, because they were the first music publishers to do this and it was moving forward. And then Pandora decided to go to the ASCAP and BMI rate courts. They asked those courts to rule that the publisher's rights withdrawals did not apply to digital services like Pandora, that it applied for licenses under the existing consent decrees. Pandora also alleged that the major music publishers and the PROs were colluding together to make changes to the ASCAP and BMI bylaws that would allow for partial withdrawals, yielding higher performance royalty rates for all of the music publishers. And uh, there were rulings that came down. Both of the rate court judges, in other words, the ASCAP rate court judge and the BMI rate court judge ruled that the music publishers could not pull just one set of licensing rights, in this case, the digital rights, from either ASCAP or BMI. That, that was the overarching ruling. The judges said that if the music publishers wanted to license directly, they would have to pull all the performance rights licensing from the PROs and the no music publisher at the time was interested really in doing that. Um, there was a difference between the ASCAP judge's ruling and the BMI judge's ruling, um, uh, but it was really a question of timing in that the ASCAP judge ruled that Pandora had an interim consent decree license, which is good till December 31st, 2015. Um, and um, on December 18th of 2013, in opposition to the ASCAP ruling, the BMI judge agreed the publishers had to be all in or all out, but he ruled there was no interim consent decree license. See what I mean by the rules? Um, which meant that if publishers decided to withdraw from BMI after December 31st of 2013, it's Pandora's BMI blanket license that it was working under all this time, may no longer cover some of those publishers' songs. So it was really um, an interesting situation. So what was the result? We don't have the complete result yet, but we do know that UMG on December 31st, 2013, and more recently actually, within the last few weeks, BMG made direct deals with Pandora for their catalogs to be able to play on Pandora. Now you might ask yourself, how can they do that and still stay with ASCAP and BMI. Didn't the judges rule they had to be all in or all out? Oh no, they found something in the consent decrees. In the consent decrees, it actually says that under the ASCAP and BMI rules, they can only represent publishers on a non-exclusive basis. So essentially, what's happened here, again, it's a, um, I want to say they did a little bit of magic here, and um, UMG and BMG are, uh, making direct deals with Pandora, yet they're still with ASCAP and BMI at this point. Um, they, they actually called it the Pandora loophole. Somebody I saw ref referred to the Pandora loophole. But um, these Pandora issues um, uh, have heralded in some of the most significant upsets and potential changes in the publishing industry. And the reason also is that it led the Department of Justice to review the PRO's long-standing consent decrees. And they're in that process right now, so we really don't know what's going to happen uh, there. The PROs, the music publishers, and others are asking the DOJ to agree to change the consent decrees so it's clear that digital rights licensing can be pulled from the PROs. That's what they want. It's not entirely clear the DOJ is going to do that, though. Um, but what will that mean? I mean, we have Pandora now under an interim consent decree license until the end of 2015. So it means all digital companies, including Pandora, 
um, when their current license is up, will have to negotiate with all of these music publishing companies either to get their services up and running if they're new or to continue to offer their services because they won't be able to clear digital performing rights at the PROs alone if the music publishers withdraw their digital rights. Let's imagine that mayhem, if you will. Um, and it's going to add a whole new level of rights clearance issues and liability potentially to this process because the lawyers for these new digital companies will have to engage in these direct deals and ensure they're covered for all of the music repertoire that is in their clients' digital services. Um, Pandora has a million songs in their database, a million plus songs in their database. Um, so if the PROs and the music publishers are successful in modifying these consent decrees, they will definitely have a business solution for getting a higher rate, no doubt about that, but it really may not be a solution for the health and the development of building new digital music companies and services because the rates will be higher. That could be a real problem for the songwriters. Um, there's also no more publishing deals, though, on the other hand, for developing songwriters. If you're a developing songwriter, it used to be when I started writing songs, um, I had two major publishing deals when I was a writer. And, um, and it, was, it was easy. They were falling out of the sky, essentially. They were terrible, but they were there. And I got advances, at least, and um, you know, was able to pay my rent and things like that. So that was great, right? But they don't really exist anymore for developing songwriters. Um, there, there's a definite dearth of those um, for the same reasons that labels really are not um, offering a lot of exclusive recording artist deals to new and emerging artists. The other thing is the oversupply. There's an oversupply of songs, and <laughs> unless you didn't notice, there's an oversupply of songs. Um, and so what does that do for licensing? Well, um, we know the laws of supply and demand, hopefully, and that leads to a downward decline in licensing fees. So whereas the fees used to be relatively healthy to get uh, a song placed in a major motion picture, it may not be so now, or a major television show it may not be so now because of that decline in licensing, pleas due to, uh, licensing fees due to oversupply. Um, also, the, this oversupply of songs lead to placement services taking larger percentages for the placement because the fee is less, so they're taking larger monies. Um, they also uh, spend much less time with each songwriter. In other words, again, there's no development or feedback. You may know about um, some services such as Taxi. Has anyone ever heard of Taxi, where the songwriter has to pay up front to Taxi to even have them listen to the song? And Broad Jam, which just has thousands of songwriters, they don't, they don't pay attention to these songwriters. They're not actually publishing companies. They purport to be music placement services. Um, and they do have some measure of success, but not really significant. Um, and as we said before, artists are getting left behind a little bit in these digital formats, but songwriters, they're really getting left behind um, on the digital formats. Um, has anybody ever heard of Desmond Child? I picked up the Desmond Child has written a, a, so many major hits. Um, for instance, he wrote Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi um, and so many other hits for so many artists uh, back in the 80s, but they're still played over and over again, these songs. And um, I found the statistic that he reported, I happen to know Desmond, so that's why I used him. Um, he reported more than six million plays on Pandora for Living on a Prayer, and his check was for $110. You can't live on that, folks. You know, um, and another uh, songwriter that I know, Ellen Shipley, she wrote a great song called Ooh, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Um, she received $39 for more than 3.1 million plays on the same service. Um, so if the publishers get this opportunity to disengage from the PROs, the songwriter shares may actually decline further. Um, because, as what I said, cross-collateralization and sometimes even net revenue models um, and no direct payment from the PRO. The other kinds of composers are library music composers. Do I, does any, I don't know if any of you work with library music composers who just sit all day in a recording studio and just churn out tracks and then they license bulk tracks 
And uh, what it was, that the, these library music composers used to get public performance royalties. Um, but now there's the rise of this new RPF license, which is royalty performance free licenses. And they have emerged to further threaten um, these composers' existence. They depended on those performance royalties because they could create a track and it would be used over and over again uh, by First National Bank in 300 different First National Bank commercials all over the United States. And they would get those public performance royalties. But now they're having to sign away those as well. They're also, in many cases, I hear the complaints, they're having to sign away their car copyrights as well. I mean, everything, just every kind of right you can imagine. So it's not very good um, for a small fee up front. Um, but there is a slight winning side here. Um, I, I saw that BMI uh, reported, I think it was last week or the week before, $977 million in revenue for its most recent fiscal year which is a 3.5% gain from the year before. And it's the most, actually, that this organization has collected in its 75-year history. And after subtracting all their administrative costs, BMI paid out more than $840 million in royalties to its members. Um, and again, we know that they have more than, way north of 500,000 songwriters and music publishers. That's about 3.2% uh, uh, from last year, and also that is a record for BMI as well. Um, so songwriters, I think, are, a, I think I would say that they're on the losing side right now. Again, it remains to be seen how they're going to come out on the other end. And the technology companies. Are they the winners? Are they the losers? Some are winners. Some may be losers. Um, as I said at the very beginning of this, the music industry is now undeniably the tech industry. Um, more than 70% of the music totally consumed in the first six months of, of the year in the United States was either downloaded or streamed, according to Nielsen SoundScan. Um, and internet industries, as we've come to know them, tend to be a winner-take-all market. We can look at Google for search engine, if you want, YouTube for online video. We can look at Facebook for social media. But that kind of dominance takes time to emerge, and streaming music is, has really yet to reach that point. There are a lot of players that are competing for the ears and the wallets of the music consumer, essentially, from Pandora and Spotify to offshoots of radio, like Clear Channel's iHeartRadio. I don't know if anybody listens to iHeartRadio, but there's new services also emerging, which we'll talk about from Apple, Google, and Amazon as well. So who are going to be the winners in this technology hunger games of the music industry? Um, Let's look at the streaming landscape a little bit by examining the Spotify versus Pandora. I think this is going to be um, instructive. It certainly was to me as I was researching it. With the exception of vinyl records, online streaming is about the only part of the recorded music industry uh, that's growing. Um, again, according to Nielsen, on-demand audio streaming revenue in the U.S. was up 52% in the first six months of this year, while digital track downloads were down 13%, sales slump just this year nearly 20%. But it's important to distinguish between these on-demand streaming services and the internet radio services like Pandora because they have different cost bases and they're actually aimed at different markets. As we talked about, one's interactive and one's non-interactive. Um, and Spotify, being an interactive service, uh, has a free ad-supported version of this. I don't know how many people listen to music on Spotify besides me. Well, you know, a lot of people do here. How many people have a subscription service to Spotify? One person. Oh, thank you. I'm going to rest my case here then. Um, free ad, this free ad supported version is extremely popular, but they also do have the subscription version uh, without ads and it also allows for offline listening. So it has about 10 or 11 million paid-up subscribers, and Spotify, in this camp of interactive services, they're the clear winner. They win over our radio and um, Deezer and Rhapsody. They are the clear winner here. But there are negatives. Um, and as stated earlier, these interactive services cannot get the benefit of the Section 114 compulsory statutory license for digital sound recording performances. And Spotify, 
Are you ready for this? Pays out 70% of its revenue for licenses. 70%. And unlike Pandora, which hosts 1 million songs, Spotify has to host over 20 million songs on its site, and many of which are never listened to. Spotify positives, it can make direct deals, so it can be offered all over the world. It can be a global market, but Pandora cannot be a global, mar a, a, a global market. It's only in the United States because of that compulsory stat license right now. Now, Pandora positives. Um, Again, they have the ability to take advantage of the stat license and they only have to maintain their catalog of a million songs and they pay out only 50% of the revenue in royalties each year, last year. So Pandora actually may be a better business model than Spotify. It may be the winner in these Hunger Games. Where Spotify is effectively targeting the market for music ownership. They're targeting the people who bought albums, who bought CDs. Um, and that, was, uh, that business was worth roughly $14 billion globally last year, um, about $8 billion for fiscal sales, $6 billion for downloads. Pandora is not. They're setting their sights on the $16 billion, adver billion dollars in advertising that advertisers will allocate this year to old-fashioned broadcast radio because, in essence, Pandora is a non-interactive service, i.e. a radio station. It's what it's been classified as. But the bottom line is for both of these services, on paper anyway, um, Pandora and Spotify are not really making any money. And if it's not making any money, could it still be the winner? Well, we know Tim Westergren, who owns Pandora, is certainly a winner. He paid himself $15 million last year. Um, but if you look at Pandora's financials, um, since its IPO in mid-2011, Pandora has eked out a quarterly profit only twice. Two times. Over the last two financial years, it's racked up $75 million in losses. Some observers say, well, this is evidence of structural flaws in the Pandora business model, but others are convinced that it still has a very bright future. Some argue that Pandora has a clear path to profitability because it pays most of its royalty costs on a per stream basis. And so all it has to do to turn up the profits is increase the number of ads it plays each hour. That would generate more ad revenue and reduce its royalty costs because it's playing more ads and slightly fewer songs overall. So that's the model for that. Pandora could also use this information that it has about its listeners to target them with specific ads, much like Facebook does. Um, in theory, this should let Pandora charge more for its ads than regular broadcast radio stations that we listen to. And as one analyst said, and I love this, old guys listen to Eric Clapton, and they're more likely to buy Viagra. Um, but even if Pandora's ability to generate sustainable profits is still up for debate, then what about Spotify? In streaming music, the more popular they get, the more royalties they have to pay. The more songs are being played. So that handicap is hard to overcome. Sure, they could, use, they could choose to spend the money and build out their um, internet radio offering. They're now looking at doing that. But it's already playing catch up with Pandora and that business. It may be too late for them. And it generates the overwhelming bulk of its revenue from subscriptions and seems committed to building its business on convincing people to pay for music. I don't know how that's working out for him, but it doesn't look great. It does not look like a winning strategy from where I'm sitting. And the major, another major issue is that unlike Apple or Google or Amazon, Spotify does not have massive cash to dip into. Um, or it doesn't even have a cross subsidy like Beats Music had the Beats headphones and all the Beats equipment. Um, so. It needs to stand on its own feet. It's actually a standalone. So many observers think that Spotify is heading for an IPO. Um, and that's what they've been talking about to raise money. And their last valuation came in at $4 billion, concomitant with its last uh, money raising. Whether can it, it can achieve this kind of windfall needed to satisfy investors through an IPO is still an open question. Um, but they may be just a pawn anyway in a bigger game because streaming music is going to be a, a high stakes game in the very near future involving the true titans of the tech world. 
Um, because for these firms like Google, like Apple, the music business is not an end in itself. It's just one piece in their battle to control the internet, they control entertainment on the internet and the future of the internet, actually. The odds are very much stacked in their favor. We know, again, uh, bears repeating, Apple spent $3 billion in Beats Music. What were they thinking? Let's see. We don't know. And they bought it, at least in part, for its streaming music platform, which some reporters say just two days ago I was reading that they're about to shut down. And then the Apple's denying that they're shutting down Beats Music again. It remains to be seen. Let's see what happens there. Um, Google recently bought Songza, which is a human curation service for music that some believe could actually threaten Pandora. Uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google, is the clear winner, as we said, for on-demand streaming of music videos. It's also reportedly on the brink of launching its new subscription-based audio focus product as well. And finally, Amazon has recently launched its own streaming pop product called Amazon Prime Music, which is available to um, Amazon Prime members, I believe. Anybody who subscribes to that Amazon Prime premium home delivery service, I couldn't live without it. <laughs> um, these companies have obvious, tremendous advantages over Pandora and Spotify, namely very deep pockets very little pressure from their investors to make money from music. In fact, music may just be a loss leader for them. So who's the winner here? The winner here may be the company who does not depend on music streaming or music subscriptions as their primary income source. We don't know for sure. Oh, the clear winners here are the music consumers. Um, no pay, lots of play. Most consumers now attribute very little value to owning the recording itself, and most consumption happens at little to zero cost to the listener. A massive decades-long shift towards free or near-free music means that entire generations have never been paid anything for recordings, and it will continue to resist any requirements to pay for music. You know, I look at this and I think of the Jews wandering in the desert. Right. Um, I, I really did think of this, actually. I thought, for music to once again be paid for, the whole generation has to completely die out, and a new generation who has actually paid for music has to uh, inhabit the new music buying space, and will that happen? No, it probably will not happen. Um, so with the advent of these new pay-to-play subscription services like Music Key, that's the YouTube one, they're calling it Music Key, I believe, there are two obvious outcomes to that. One, it may drive people back to piracy if they have to now pay for music on YouTube, um, or they, it may get a new generation used to paying subscription service fees for ad-less listening, less listening without ads, or maybe offering some other value add benefit, but maybe not. Again, we don't know. The another thing on the, on the winning side, I just want to mention real briefly, is prosumerism. Has anybody ever heard this phrase before? Prosumerism. It's really interesting. Um, <coughs> we hear it sometimes when I'm talking to my, my techie people um, who are dealing in the music space. And prosumers are producer consumers. And this deals with the concept of user-generated content, which of course brings up a whole legal can of worms that is far beyond the scope of what this talk is about tonight. Um, but user-generated content is when the listener actually contributes some type of content to the experience, the musical experience that they're experiencing online. Um, social media and sites like YouTube have given rise to this whole new brand of artists. All you have to do is get on YouTube and see how people are taking other people's videos and mashing them up to make one song, which is fabulous, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, the artist can remix now. The artist can mash up music. Um, I'm sorry, not the artist, but the consumer, the listener, can do all these things very easily now. And the funny part is, or the wonderful part, or the not so wonderful part, depending on how you look at it, they can make money doing this by the YouTube Partners program when they post their videos. And who's going to stop them? Again, it would be complete whack-a-mole. So it's like a musical conversation is always happening between actual artists and their fans and listeners now. And it's an interesting um, byproduct, if you will, of the technological advances. Um, I think 
piracy sites already said, you know, winners or losers. Well, I have a feeling that they could have a comeback if the subscription services change to um, a, a to four fee. Uh, but we don't know if that's going to happen or not. But right now they are tamped down. There's no question about that. The other lurking threat, finally, is I want to mention is um, the FCC um, and the net neutrality issue. I don't know how many of you. Uh, of people follow this issue, but it is really an, a very important issue. Um, the FCC at this moment is considering creating what's known as the two-tiered internet, the fast lane and the slow lane. Fast lane for those that can pay, slow lane for those who cannot. Um, the ones in the fast lane will be the ones that can pay these oligopolistic telecommunications companies the toll, essentially and they are lobbying virulently to see that this occurs. Um, this issue of net neutrality, I, I think, is a defining issue because, you know, the Internet controls how we do everything, how we consume information, how we consume media and art, its necessity for our businesses. It's critical to how we innovate, how we communicate, how we learn, how we educate. Um, control of the Internet is control of our minds. It is, and it's control of our world. So we have to really look at this situation of net neutrality, in other words, really leveling it out for all to be able to get on the internet and to innovate. Um, these, YouTube would never have happened had there been a fast lane or slow lane. Netflix never would have happened had there been a fast lane or slow lane. And so many other services that had to get onto the internet and innovate in order to be able to um, create a new model or a new business or a new uh, community in some cases. So this will affect songwriters and publishers and musicians and labels because the internet essentially is the portal for musicians, not to mention all other kinds of entertainment entrepreneurs. Both B2B sites and direct-to-fan sites hinge on the ability to offer, display, and deliver various types of content to users via the sites. So it would be disastrous, in my opinion, for musicians and music industry entrepreneurs, innovators, and other creators if telecoms are given the green light to create a free structure based on broadband usage, thereby essentially creating the internet into cable TV, which is what it could become. Um, so the standalone services are very vulnerable as well. And um, I, I think that net neutrality is something that everybody should look into, into if you are representing musicians or entertainment industry individuals or keep abreast of these situations as they unfold because they are unfolding um, rapidly and before our eyes. Um, so anyway, the law, as we know, is still being finely honed as a weapon here. And absent a coherent legal framework for any of these things, um, all the music industry participants really don't know where to go. I mean, essentially, the music industry hunger games, who are the winners, who are the losers? Right now, we really just don't know. So stay tuned, everybody. Thank you.